Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Subscriptions for Authors podcast. So this podcast, our goal is to help you start and grow your subscription, build deeper connections with your readers, and build a business based off of recurring revenue. So hopefully you can go full time as an author, or if you're not full time yet, that you can take your career to the next level. That's our goal. And Serial Fiction happens to be a way that a lot of authors are simultaneously building community but also finding new fans. In fact, many, many successful subscription authors found most of their audience in serial fiction and regularly write serial fiction. But we haven't explicitly talked about serial fiction in a full episode on the podcast. And that's why we decided to bring in Amalana Albertson, who might just be one of the best serial fiction writers in the world. In fact, she was the number two author on Radish for two years straight and is a number three best-selling author on Amazon. Alana Albertson is an amazing, amazing author. She's had novels traditionally published and that are now in the TV film world, which we touch on a little bit, and serials has a lot to do with it. And we also talk all about how you can write great serial fiction that hooks your readers and builds your fan base. Alana Albertson has a ton of experience in teaching authors about serial fiction through a six-figure serials course. So I think this will be a great one because she has tons of insights for us and is just an incredible person to chat with. So we're going to get right into this podcast. I hope you all enjoy it. Amazing to have you on the podcast and talk all about one of your many expertises, which is serial fiction. But before we get to that point, especially because subscriptions and serial fiction have so much overlap, I want to hear about what got you into writing fiction? What got you into being a full-time author? Because your origin story is very unique, but in a good way. Yeah, that's like the weirdest question for me because I, when I hear all this, people are like, I always wanted to be a writer and like they talk about how they were young and I think you, know, you were a young writer. I never wanted to be a writer. So I'm like, the, all I wanted to do was be a professional ballroom dancer. And I went to Stanford and I was an educator. So I focused on SAT bias. I worked at Fair Test in Cambridge. So all I cared about was like educational equity. And But I was an English major, so that's oh, okay. But I'm half Mexican. And so I really read at Stanford, I read a bunch of books on literature of passing, um, of African-American passing in the early 1900s. And so that like really identified with me, but I never really saw myself in any type of fiction. And then I read Arthurian Lit and Shakespeare. And, and I was like, completely honestly, I was a full on literary snob, right? I didn't read commercial fiction. I'd never read a romance. I was like, oh my gosh, have you read? Yeah, no, it was bad. Like I was totally like, no. And so it was never on my radar. I was competing in ballroom dancing and I was running in. I went to Harvard, I got my master's in education and I ended up doing SAT prep, GMAT prep, GRE prep, LSAT prep. I'm like this weirdo that loves standardized tests. And then I read this book called, do I have it here? No, it's called Dirty Girls Social Club by Elisa Valdez Rodriguez. And it was about six Latinas who lived in Boston and I was living in Boston and they were college educated. And it was a chiclet book. And I was just, it was the first time I'd ever seen myself in a book ever. So this is my full representation matters, right? And so I was like, oh my gosh, like this is incredible. Cause I only read books by dead people from like, I read Tolstoy. Like I was just, again, I was a super literary snob. And this book like just changed. I'd never read anything. I'd never read like an airport book, a thriller, anything. So anyway, I totally stalked her and I went to an author event and no, not an author event. She had a fan event because I was, and I, if people would say, do you want to write? I'd be like, I'm not a writer. Like, I'm never going to write. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. And so I started telling all these people, this is before, so I'm 46. So this is, I'm 20 bar or five. And I was a competitive ballroom dancer. And this is before it was on Dancing with the Stars. So nobody had heard of that. Everyone was like, you dance in a bar? I'm like, no, I do waltz and tape. But no one knew what I was talking about. So I would start telling her all these and all the people, all these insane stories about people who now are on Dancing with the Stars in the ballroom community. And she was like, you should write a book. And I was like, I don't write. I would never write. She's like, no. And she kept hounding me. So I went to another event with her. She had these Chicolette festivals. 
and they were all Latina agents and editors and whatever. And I met an agent and, or I met an editor who's still a friend of mine now. And she was like, you should write a book. And I'm like, I just, I don't write books or whatever. So anyway, I finally was like, okay. And I wrote the worst 50 pages. I just cringe. It's so telling. And, and it was hard. I think part of the, and this isn't like a snob thing, but part of the Stanford Harvard thing, it's like, I had such high expectations and my writing was so awful. It was just so bad. And I was like, this is such a joke. Like I can right at all. But randomly, Elisa sent it to her agent because she loved it. And then the agent loved it. But I didn't like that agent. And then I met my agent who's been my agent since 2008, Jill Marcel. I'm obsessed with her. I don't know how she's never dropped me. Like she's been my agent forever. But we shopped it as a chiclet book, traditional, and it didn't sell. We had one offer from some like weird press. And then we had one offer overseas because ballroom was big in, in the UK, but, but it didn't work out. And I don't know, it was just bad. So she was like, you should write it as a romance. And I was like, I've never read a romance in my life. So she sentenced me to a Danielle Steele. And I was horrified. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm this literary snob. I don't read this. This is like, this is so, I do not read these type of books. Like everyone probably hates me on this podcast now, but I was just kind of conditioned. And you even now, like at the Harvard Stanford alumni magazines, they're like, hey, have you ever written a real book? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I can write 50 pages about a bird also, but I want people to read my fiction. So anyway, she told me to write a romance and I read this romance, which I did not like, but it was set in Marin where I'm from. So it was cool. And I wrote this romance again, horrible. It's totally awful, but I didn't let her shop it. Cause right at that time I had a bunch of friends. I joined RWA and because it's me, I like became president of the Chicklet chapter and the president of the contemporary romance chapter and president of the YA chapter. And I had friends who were starting to indie publish. And so she wanted to shop it, but she wanted me to rewrite it and it wasn't good. So she's hundred percent right in this scenario. I'm not. So I just, I published it and nobody bought it. I have it here. But it's now rewritten, but this was my first horrific book. It was so bad. And so it's a bad bomb dancer and a Marine. It's awful. Anyway, <laughs> do not read it. And so it's horrible. Don't read my books. That's the <laughs> first read. line in marketing. Right? Full on cringe. The full on like, I can't even. And so then I wrote, because I used to do about ballet. So then I wrote some other weird book I wrote, which also nobody bought. It was a Nutcracker retelling set in Boston, but it's there's a serial killer in the Nutcracker. I actually like this book, but anyway, so again, nobody nice bought it. Cool. Yeah, it was actually cool. I should probably rewrite it. And then I wrote like a YA book, which I never actually published, but I actually put it in a thing. So this is actually, no one can find this book. And so this is about a, it's a uh, picture Dorian Gray retelling about this Mexican girl who's an influencer. I'll probably rewrite this one. This one I actually love. So all I cared about was that. So anyway, then I wrote this blurb. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like romance gold, right? But I was like, oh God, I had not written the book, but I wrote this blurb, which I'll read to you. I'll be honest with you. I'm no hero. Sure. The media tries to brand every Navy SEAL as some kind of Batman dressed in camis. There's a line in our cadence. Superman is man of steel. He's no match for Navy SEAL. You've seen the movies were invincible and valuable that night i just wanted to get laid one night with an aruban horn no strings attached i picked her out of a lineup wild dark hair long eyes cracked smile after i relaxed back on the creaky stained cot thankful for the blissful experience that she gave me i where i forgot the seconds of the faces of my buddy who died because i made the wrong call the tears of the children i couldn't save and the eyes of the enemies i slaughtered during the last seconds of life before i left her hazel eyes peered in my soul she whispered in a distinct california accent my name is annie hamilton i'm an american citizen i was kidnapped on spring break five years ago you're my only hope please save me when desperate plea this wasn't a hollywood blockbuster or new york times best thriller i knew there was no time for excuses no margin for errors i had to put on my cape and be her hero so i wrote this blurb i hadn't written the book whoa yeah, this was, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's yeah. a blurb. That's, it was, it was wow. literally like just a novel about my ex cheating on me with a hooker, right? So I was just like, oh, this is funny. But anyway, I went to sleep and I had not written the book. I just wrote that blurb. I'm like, hey, and she's like, what is that? I'm like, I was just screwing around. And she put it on Goodreads and whatever. I went to sleep. Next thing we have 10,000 ads. I had literary agents calling me. People were like begging for this book. Back then, this is 2014. So again, I had released two books. I had released my stupid dancing book, which nobody bought, who wasn't related to me and the Nutcracker thing. And I was working on the YA book that I actually cared about. And I only wanted to be like trad for the YA book. But anyway, that book went viral. And back in 2014, bloggers 
were what made or break you. And so AS, Aestis, Maurice, and Totally Booked all were like posting about it. And they were like, where's this book? I'm like, I haven't even written this book. This is just like a joke. So anyway, I wrote the book and I debuted at the store 74, like 74 on Amazon wide with 10,000. So then I started writing. So that's my story. What a story. Wow. You got me on that blurb. I, yeah, I think I need to read that. I, that's, wow. I mean, that, that's it. I, that's why I went viral. It hit a chord with people. Let's well, now I'll, dive I'll, I'll tell you real quick why it went viral. The reason it went oh. viral, I think, in my opinion, is at that point in the romance thing, there had been a Navy SEAL book that had just been released right before, traditional. And the guy was awesome. Like he was like this nice guy and he had, the girl was like a single mother of seven and pregnant with her eighth kid and her husband died and he married her and he like left. And I'm not dissing the, I never even read the book. Like I don't like whatever, but like he left the, he lived in Texas and SEALs can't live in Texas. There's only two bases and he left the SEALs to open a pie shop. And so I said, she's obviously never met a Navy SEAL because I had just been in this horrific relationship with these guys in San Diego. And that's so it was like the anti thing. So that was at the beginning of the dark romance where at the time in romance, all these Navy SEALs were like these nice, sweet guys. And my guy was just this total jerk. He literally hired a hooker, but like he saved it. So it was like that twist in it. And so I think that's what worked. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about serial fiction is whatever you expect the book to be, you flip it. Okay. Wow. So I actually want to now ask you, you go from here to being on Radish. So did this book itself, because I know you've had many books that you've written that have done very well in Radish, and one of them was related to Navy SEALs, but Radish didn't exist in 2014. No, so, Tell me so, your story with... Your yeah, so that book blew up and I was like, oh God, now I'm going to be writing these forever and I don't even want to write this stuff, right? Because like, well, nothing gets to stop. I didn't want to write about SEALs. I just didn't want to. So then I wrote, I think one of the questions I know for that other thing, someone said, who's your mentor? I met online Linda Barlow, who I had followed. She was this huge romance author and she's older than me. And I was like, oh my gosh, are you the Linda Barlow who won the Rita in 83 for falling? And so she and I over Facebook wrote Badass, another Navy SEAL book, but it's a stepbrother SEAL book. And so we wrote this <laughs> over Facebook Messenger and it was a joke. So basically all these stepbrother books were good. And I'm like, let's do a stepbrother SEAL sealed. We, we literally wrote it in two weeks and yeah, it's a ridiculous book. But anyway, so we wrote this book and she's the best writer ever. So in terms of a mentor and I knew nothing about romance. So Invincible has a lot of issues that I fixed in rewrites, but she, I would write her this passage and she was like, okay, what's your goal? Like just total masterclass in romance. She was like, if he's a firefighter, she's an arsonist. And I was like, oh, like mind blown, like just everything. And so we wrote this book over Facebook messenger. We got a cover and we uploaded it and we didn't even think any, and Invincible had done well. And she was this huge author, traditional, but she had an indie published. And so whatever, we just, again, within a week it blew up. And so this is all, yeah, pre-radish. And within a week it blew up and we were in number three in the entire Amazon paid store and top. So that's Girl on the Train and Badass is right here. So we were number three in the entire store. Yeah. Patterson. Yeah. So Girl on the Train, Blake Crouch, Pines, Wayward Pines, Badass, The Stepbrother Seal, James Patterson, 14th Deadly Sin, Memory Man, David Baldocci, and A Crow Hollow by Michael Wallace. So we just blew up and we had no idea what happened. And we were just like, oh my God. So we were, and so then Amazon reached out to us and all this kind of stuff. So the book just did incredibly well. So that's 2015. And then, in, and so, and then 2016, I wrote a Beauty and the Beast retelling, which also did really well. I think it was 40 in the store. Okay. But around this time I was started getting restless and all my indie books were really doing well. I was always in the top a hundred and I was obsessed with Homeland, like obsessed with Homeland. Has, have you, either of you seen Homeland? I know I talked to you about Homeland the other day, but amazing. It's about it or Damien Lewis, binge it, just incredible. But they do something in season two that was this twist that blew me away, blew me away. And I was just like, oh my God, I don't know how to write. This is what I want to do. So I decided that I wanted to write a TV show. Of course, I have zero connections with the TV industry and I had no idea what I was doing. So I didn't, even though I was making all this money on these books, I was like, I want to write a TV show. So I decided to write these Seven Deadly Seals and I write them as novellas that are episodes. And so these are the original versions of them. So this is like episode one, episode two. And it's very, it is a romance, but it's just incredibly messed up. And it's a, more of a TV show. It's a true serial, season one, season two. So I wrote these and I started putting them out. 
and and I'm like the worst writer ever in the sense that I would put one out and five years later I'd put or like they put the other one out a year later all my fans are like in huge cliffhangers or whatever and I would put these out in between I think the first one came out yeah the first one came out before Badass so I would stagger them in between my big books and anyway they were doing really well and then I went to RWA in 2017 and I was speaking on a panel on six figure indies and Cy who's the founder of Radish. And he had graduated from Oxford. He was famous by bringing over uh, the guy who sings Gangnam Style to his university. And he had done the startup and he had gone to Korea and seen all these people reading on apps. And he was like, what is that? And that's how he started a Radish. And he had gotten funding from Amy Tan, who lives in Marin, Joy Luck Club, who is like my idol. And so I was really impressed by this guy. So anyway, he's, will you meet with me at 8 a.m. in like Florida? I'm like East Coast time, like I'm still on California time and whatever. So I meet him and he, and I am at this point selling very well in Amazon and this series is selling really well. They're all out and they're doing incredibly well. I'm making at that point, probably eight to 10,000 a month on that series alone on Amazon. Cause it did really well. And so he goes, will you take all of these off and put it on radish? I'm like, are you insane? No, no, you've got to be like, I'm making this much money. He's please, we have this platform and we're going to do all this stuff. And I'm like, and I just sat there and this is why I really want to talk to everyone about new technology and that kind of new things. And especially with Reem is that I was like, look, I'm an idiot. Cause even though I was big, I didn't self publish till 2013. And some of the people that were here huge it started in like 12 and whatever and I was but at that point I was writing but I was like oh I'm only gonna go try and I'm an agent and I was like you're gonna take a chance on him and I literally pulled the books from Amazon and I sobbed I was like for sure making the biggest mistake in my author career because I was like I'm making money on this and I'm going on this app I've never heard of for this guy I've never heard of and he starts uploading them. And at the time they had other huge authors on there that he had gotten, but they had book, they were putting their books up. They weren't putting the serials up. So he'd like Alessandro Tor, and I think he had Kendall, I mean, he had a bunch of huge authors, but I, mine was a true serial. Mine is a television, it's like a thing. So he started uploading it and I just, it just blew up and I, and they couldn't even believe it. I was the number two on the app for two years until I stopped uploading because I haven't uploaded in two years. That's another story we'll get into. I made so much money and I was so grateful that I, that I took that chance on that new technology. So that's my rabbit. That's my serial story. That's where we are. Uh, yeah, I know that's. There's so much to unpack in there. One, I'm just like curious, like what happens when Amazon reaches out to you when you get to the top of the store? That feels like a Jeff coming in. <laughs> what happens when Amazon reaches out? So Amazon was amazing. I have a rep, which having a rep is the best thing ever. And my original rep left. They promoted you at the same time we were a stepbrother book. So they were like, but we were outselling everyone. We were outselling these huge names. But what Amazon has always been amazing to me. I think the thing that was really hurtful for me is at that time, our book was selling so well. We're better than all these books. And I would go to all these local bookstores and say, hey, will you stock my book? Like we've sold 10,000 copies last week here's a picture like we're out let's go on the train and us right we're right here and they refused to sell my book and they were like oh it's not a real book and I was like okay maybe I'm sure I suck as an author but Linda Barlow has 30 traditionally published books and she won a Rita and she won an RT Times and she's probably one of the best living romance authors we're a legitimate book we just published it ourselves and we couldn't get any traction and so that was the first time that I considered going trad and that's what led it to me because even though I had this incredible success and more importantly, not more importantly, but I it was very financially lucrative. I felt at that time that block that I couldn't push my career to the next level. And more importantly, once I got obsessed with some deadly seals, all I wanted to do is I wanted this to be a television show. And I found this amazing thing, Amelia, you should do this. It's sorry, Michael, you can't, it's only women, but it's the best experience of my life. I went to Headbrook. I applied for this one week masters in TV writing program with the showrunner from Homeland, who I'm like a psycho stalker. They shouldn't have let me in. Meredith Snyme and the showrunner of CSI. And it was all women. They call it a retreat, but it's like a rehab. They take your phone. You don't have internet. You make your own fire. Like it's literal. I thought I was going to die out there. I was like, this is going to be a horror novel, but she took the pilot. I had written for Seven Deadly Seals. I'd written a pilot. And I, of course, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to write a pilot, but I bought final draft and I wrote it and she rewrote it with me. Like we workshipped it and it's amazing. It's so good. Not no props to me. Like she's a showrunner of Homeland. She has an Emmy, but she rewrote my pilot. 
and I could not get it. So then I said, Hey, I have this pilot. I wrote it. It's it's solid. It's number two on Radish and has been for two years. It has millions of views. It has an 80% read through rate. I went to all these film agents. I said, can I get this read? Can someone read this so I can get into TV? And I couldn't even get a meeting. All I wanted was them to at least read my pilot and say, Hey, you suck. You can't write, go home. But no, no one would even read it. They were like, no, you can't. You're indie. Oh, it's indie. And I'm like, yeah, but Radish and we're this and that. And I've sold this many. No one would even take my meetings. And that was when I was like, I'm going trad to get a TV deal. And I ended up getting one. So it was this full manifest, like wishful thing. Wow. No, that's, (laughs) It's really sad. It's still in the Hollywood space can be that way. I think it is shifting, but I do know a lot of the people who work in Hollywood. I don't even know if they're fully aware of what happens in the world of indie authors and just how much readers are consuming books and how amazing these stories are most importantly. But I kind of want to now talk about what makes your story so amazing, because it sounds like from you. Like you weren't doing much marketing. Like I know, I don't need to even tell you this. There's a lot of authors spend a lot of money to be at the top of the Amazon store and Amazon ads and Facebook ads, nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't sound like you had a six figure ad budget to be doing what you were doing. I could be wrong. No. And that's one thing I'll never, like I teach bosses, I'll never do ads or whatever. We did run some ads for badass. I didn't do any for invincible or whatever, but we didn't know what we were doing in defense of everyone else. Back then there were less books. So of course, anyone who published in 2014, 2015 had it easier, but I didn't even have a newsletter like I did. And so when I teach all my classes, when I talk to authors, I'm like, do as they say, and not as I do, I did everything wrong. If I was launching today, I would do stuff completely different. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just literally put the books out and I hermited myself in and they sold. I didn't pay. So a lot of people ask me like, oh, how'd you promote Radish? I didn't. Like, I know how to now if you're on Radish and I can tell you things you did. I did nothing. Like, it just blew up. And I think one of the things is that a lot of times I'll see in these author groups, they talk everything and they're like, this book isn't working what I'm doing. And they fix the cover and they fix the blurb and they fix all this kind of stuff. And all of that is important. And I clearly, I had a good blurb and clearly I had good covers, but you got to learn, you got to write. And so my craft, I think I'm the world's worst writer, despite my success. Like every time I read, I'm like, oh gosh, why is anyone? But so I'm constantly working on my craft. I'm constantly taking writing classes. I take writing classes like Stanford online. I I take with Stegner Fellows. I literally am constantly working on my craft and I'm not like, oh, I'm so awesome because I really don't think that. But yeah, I didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't do any of that. It's hard because I always find that it's way easier to try and think about a hack. Oh, I just got to change this cover and that's it. Like it's way easier to think about doing that. Cause I'm saying this as like guilty as charged. Like I did that for years. I was like, okay, this isn't working. Let me just try this new Facebook ad strategy or this new Amazon ad or this 99 cent promo. And like, it's just gonna, it's gonna click eventually. And this algorithm is gonna get me discovered and it's gonna work. And I never really had the obsession around the craft that I should have. I just wanted to write, but I never actually told myself the hard question, which is maybe you need to make your stories better for the specific audience you're going for. So I'm guilty of charge. That's, I've made that mistake plenty of times, but you obviously have this special focus on just writing the best stories. And when it comes to that, specifically serial fiction, I want to start with, you're mentioning things like a true serial. And what is a true serial? What makes something serial fiction versus just a novel? How would you define that difference? Yeah, absolutely. And so this is so the number one thing I see with people on Radish or on Wattpad, they're like, oh, I didn't get this or whatever. 99%, first off, my backlist is up on Radish, right? And so I'm not like, oh, I don't put my, so sure, I will take one of my books, like Invincible, and I will chop it up into little scenes and put it up. I want extra money just like everyone, okay? However, that is not a, ser- a serial. I crafted my serial 100% differently from the get-go. I see it as a TV show. I did a lot of stuff with TV writing. So I planned it as season one. And I did seven, and that was just because I called it Seven Deadly Sin- Seals, which is sins, right? So I did seven 25K novellas. And then the way I look at it is each chapter is a scene. And then each novella is a episode and then that, and then the seven were a season. So now because it's romance and because it's still book, I did do a happily ever after of couple one in season one, couple two in season two, couple three in season three, but all the characters from all the books are in book one and are fully integrated. I knew the ending. I knew the cliffs. I knew everything. And I write to my cliffs and you also end each chapter on the rising action, not on the resolution. So like in romance, 
lot of times I'll be like, oh, and they cuddled up by the fire. No, no. Like I want, if you, they, they cuddle by the fire, your reader is going to cuddle by the fire and go to sleep. Never in a chapter and they're going to sleep. Never. I'm sure I, you can probably find one of my chapters on, the, on falling asleep, but do not do that. So I always end on a cliff, whether it's like he says something and you don't know the answer or whatever. So I structure it that you have to read the next chapter. So that's one of the things I do. But anyway, there's an overall series arc. There's a season arc and then there's episode arcs and each one. And I have it in this like system and it was really from TV and it was really from Homeland. And I wrote this before I met Meredith Stein and she's like, I'm obsessed with her. It's so funny. We were supposed to be workshopping my thing. I'm like, can you explain to me in season two? But she's okay. Like I was fully fangirling her. She was like, oh my gosh, I love you. But it was like, she should have gotten restraining her. I was like obsessed with her, but she was like three lines of dialogue. No matter, do you have the script here? I can show you guys a script. I don't think it's in my office, but three lines of dialogue, no more ever. And I was like, what? So then from now on, all my books, I never do more than three lines of dialogue. And you'll see a lot of authors, both Indy and Trad, they'll just go on these speeches. We don't talk in speeches. Clearly I'm talking in a speech right now for a podcast, but in general, you're like, hey, how are you? How's the coffee? Oh, great. what you do today? And so it, it really worked on my craft. And then I started reading, I read scripts. And then when I watch TV, I watch it as a as a watcher, which is like fun. And then I watch it as a writer, which is not fun. And I read as a writer, which is not fun. And it's taken a lot of joy out of my writing, but and my reading, but I'll watch TV and I'll be like, why, why did this end? Why am I, do I want to watch it? Do I want to watch the next thing? If I don't, why not? And so I go through all that emotional pain when I watch <laughs> TV. So. I actually feel the same way about reading. It's really hard for me to read and find enjoyment anymore because I read a story and I'm like, I either don't like this because I want something else to happen or it's not the way I would have written it or it's really good, but I'm just thinking way too much about how it's structured and, and like, it just takes the enjoyment out of it. Yeah. And prior yeah, to me too. Reading, I was this huge reader. I loved reading. That's why I got into it. And I don't, and it sounds horrible to see all these people on the, I needle point now. That's my new theme because I can't read for enjoyment. I want to, and I read my friend's books and yeah. there's books that are incredible. Even if the book is the best book, it is very difficult for me because I'm like, oh, I wonder why they did this. Oh, gosh, I suck. Why do I even write? You know what I mean? I can't separate, you know, it's not about me. I'm supposed to like enjoy the book, but I'm like, I can't enjoy the craft anymore. Yeah. I, it, it's very difficult for me to read now. I'm so glad you said that because I feel like a lot of people think that way too, like a lot of authors, but everyone is always, I love reading so much and I just can't, I can never relate. And I Thank can't. you. I used to, like when I met my husband before e-readers and he was stationed in Hawaii, he was a Marine, I would bring two suitcases. There was no bookstore in Hawaii and I would bring two book cases full of books because I would run out and then what was I going to do? I would completely, and he would laugh. I would have like my actuals and I would have two extras and I would read them. And now when I go places, I bring my needle point or I bring it because I still read, but I, it's not this like relaxing thing for me. It's like a stressful experience. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to turn off like the writer, author, storyteller mind and go into like reader zone. I know for me, I never used to read nonfiction, but that's like basically 80 to 90% of what I read now, because I don't do that with now. Atomic Habits, and I read that because I can read it and I'm trying to get something, but I can't read fit yet. Yeah, I do better with TV, but I think that's also because I don't, I have never written serials. I want to write serials and that might come. So TV is still relaxing for me, but I bet that'll change one day. Let me go into that real quick. So after the serial thing and whatever, and I was still releasing books, but I felt really blocked by the fact that Again, if someone read my pilot, which was edited by Meredith, so it was incredible. Like I wrote it and it sucked. I read it now. I'm like, it's so good. And it's 80% her because she literally rewrote the full thing when we were at in Hedgebrook. And it's amazing. I was really bitter. And I was like, a lot of the author advice, which I agree, they'll be like, because the biggest mistake I've made as an author is a genre hop. I'm like, oh, look, a serial. Oh, look, a rom-com. Oh, look, this. And the readers want the same thing consistently. And that's how you're growing your brand. And so all that advice is write your next book and just stay in your lane and whatever. And I was like, I want to be in somebody else's lane. Like, I was like, I saw Crazy Rich Asians 
And it was like a religious experience for me. And I was like, this is so incredible. And it's a romance. I was like sobbing in the theater. People are like, okay, what's wrong with this girl? And I was like, this is what I want to write. And so I emailed my agent who, again, this has been my agent since 2008. This is 2020. She never dropped me. She kept saying, hey, do you want to send me a book? I'm like, no, because I was making too much indie. And I was like, I'm writing Crazy Rich Mexicans. And I wrote the 50 pages overnight and I sent it to her. And we had four trad deals, four traditional deals offers the next day. And then she published it in Publishers Weekly when we signed. And then we had three offers for producers. And then one of them though was a film agent with William Morris. And then she shopped it. And then we had five offers, but then one dropped out, two movies, two TV, and then I'm optioned for TV and a stream restricted up. And I can't give details on that publicly, but it's happening. But the only reason I went trad was because I, indie authors are just as talented as trad authors. Indie authors create incredible work, but there are barriers. And immediately from being trad, all of a sudden I got invited to the Tucson Literary Festival and the alumni magazine started talking. And whereas before that, I was like, hey, do you remember me? Like, I, I think Stanford Magazine, they had written something about trashy Nora Roberts. And I wrote them like this three page letter that they published about. So it was just this thing, but the reason I went trad was because I wanted this film TV opportunity. That is what I did. And it luckily happened. It's killed my indie career because I'm no longer allowed to publish with, outside of certain things. I'm under two contracts, both with my traditional publisher, but also with the producers for my television show. So that's why people are like, I, my poor readers, they're like, I left him hanging at uh, halfway through season two of Seven Deadly Seals. It's all written. And if you look at my comments of Radish, they're like, we hate this girl. She's a liar. Like she said she can publish, but her trad books out. I'm under a three book contract. I legally can't publish, but I did this for the sole reason that, and I made more indie. So I did this for the sole reason of this fantasy life that I wanted. Yeah. I, first of all, congratulations. This is going to be amazing. And wherever and whenever it comes out on television, I look forward to watching it from a place of enjoyment rather than writer <laughs> animal. You guys can come over. I'm having a huge lunch party at my house with all the, all the people. So yeah. Oh, that would oh be my fun. gosh. That There's sounds so much fun. fun. Yeah. In San Diego. So hopefully. Give me an excuse to come out to California. I like to say that California is the kind of place I'd like to live part-time, but maybe not, not full-time, but that's just me, but I love it out there. It's awesome. No, I love that. You say a few interesting things here because I immediately am thinking about your readers and I know you have a big Instagram. How are you and are you still maintaining a relationship with them? Are you, because a lot of authors will talk about their social media and how should I use social media as an author? And it looks like you can't publish books right now, but I'm sure you're still using social media. So how have you approached that during this period? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I feel I'm, I have not done a good job of it. So I was super active on my Instagram. That was my thing. While I was indie, there was a time I was a influencer and Amazon and other publishing companies would pay me up to $1,000 a post. If you can scroll, you scroll way back on my Instagram, you'll see paid pro promos from different books, publishers were sending it to me and it was great. And then when this happened, I have so much immense guilt because I feel bad that I've left them hanging and there were other books. And so I had pre-orders that I had to cancel. And I don't think readers, so we talk about this divide as authors, we know the difference between indie and trad, but readers don't get it. So they really think like I'm a like psychopathic liar or something. I don't know, because I'm like, I literally can't publish. They're like, well, that doesn't make sense. You publish this book. I'm like, that's under the contract and this isn't, and I'm not allowed to do it. And so it's, they feel betrayed, especially the seven deadly seals people. And so what I should have done is done it or it definitely started a Patreon or now Ream so I could publish it there. However, when I signed the contract, I wasn't thinking about that because I'm an idiot. So I don't have an exclusion for that. So I am actually, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get permission to go on Ream because the books are, I can't put the book out three months before, three months after. And then there's windows that I can, but then they make me do all this other stuff. So it's, and don't, I, I'm not trashing. Trad is amazing, but it's a totally different thing. And it's very hard to make a living as a traditional published author. But my, I have so many friends, indies who make a living indies. And so my trad friends are like lawyers and they're all these incredible people. And they write at night because they take your advance. And I had a massive advance. I think it was called the publisher's thing. They call very good advance, but it was like a high six figure advance, but they split it over 
12 payments over, I was supposed to have a book coming out every year and it was like over five years. So there's no way, but now I can live off my backlist and I can promote it, but I have not done it. I don't have a Facebook group. I have one, but I never post. I rarely post on social media anymore. I do send out my newsletter, but I have not done. So I assume my fans are going to abandon me or whatever. At some point I'll come back, but I'm a hundred percent on their side. If I was the reader, I would hate me, but it was a choice I made and yeah. Don't be me. <laughs> Interact well, with your fans. Have a ream. Continue to publish. I just, I need an exclusion in my contract. We can talk about that off air. I think yeah. one, one thing just in general that I will share, this is not legal advice, but a law is an act of boundary making. And it's yeah. all about who considers what is in which category. So there's always ways to create new worlds, new definitions. As fiction authors, we're pretty good at spinning narratives. But regardless yeah, of that. In the contract, there are a lot of things where it's like, my book was supposed to be out in a reasonable period of time. They've delayed my book. The second book, Kiss Me, Me and More, which isn't coming out till July, was supposed to be out in November. And I can definitely argue, hey, like I'm allowed to publish. And so they're saying the paper delay, like it's all the stuff, but I've written the books on my yeah. contract. And so, yeah, I hear you. I agree. We'll work it out, but. Yeah, no, I think it's great for people to hear, I think your experience with Indie than Trad, because I know plenty of authors right now who are Indian. I think traditional publishers are moving a bit more into wanting to work, especially in the romance genre with authors who are doing really well. And I'm curious for you, if there's anything looking back outside of maybe you would have maybe gotten exclusion on the contract for something like being able to post on Rain. but is there anything else as you made this switch to being a hybrid author? I'll use that term that you would maybe tell other authors who are considering a switch or who also have gotten approached because that's definitely becoming more and more of a thing. Absolutely. So number one, I would not have taken any contract if it wasn't huge. So actually, Mont and Montlake offered to me and I sobbed when I turned them down because they were like, we'll promote your backlist. And I'm like, but I love, but the reason I felt like I'd already achieved that success on Amazon with Badass. And so I was looking to get into print, into TV, into bookstores and like those type of events. So that's why I wanted to go with a big five just for distribution. But here's the thing. There's this delusion that I think a lot of authors think that, oh, okay, let's say you're doing, let's say you're a mildly successful indie, like you're just making some or whatever. I would never sign a trad deal unless I had a huge advance. And I think my advance was pretty big. And even then I made more indie. So I'm fully honest with that. You have to look obviously at your family situation and what you can do. If I didn't have my backlist or anything, then I would definitely have to have gone back to tutoring GMAT to support the lifestyle and my expenses based on what I was making indie versus what I was doing now because indie, you can just be like, Hey, like I'm going to write this book and publish it and market it, do whatever. And I could guarantee a level of income with indie that I knew that I could get, even if a book was a flop, like I would know like how to do it and spike it and everything like that. You just can't do with trad. So trad is amazing for all these different opportunities, but it's a different thing. If your goal is to support yourself financially and not in full time, I'd say it's a very hard trad unless you're one of the top authors and i do not consider myself a top author trad i do think once the tv show comes out that'll change but like, i have a few friends who are top like new york Times bestsellers and whatever and they're fine there but indie author being an indie author you can support yourself in multiple ways subscription services radish wide everything like that there's constant different ways that you can market and trad you're losing control for so much stuff so one of the ideas i had for trad so my book ramon and julieta which is the one that's going to be the tv show what's the series so they're deciding if the book two will be second season or a separate show, but that's another story. But it's the, these kids, right? So their parents, his father met, stole his mother's fish taco recipe in Baja in the 70s. And then he meets her. He's a gentrifying guy and he meets this girl and she's a seat table taqueria chef. And they kiss the next day. He's buying her entire block and turning this historically Mexican neighborhood in Taco Bell and a Starbucks and all this stuff. So anyway, I have this idea as an indie author. I'm like, okay, so I just was bored last night and I wrote a hundred page. So like a, I think it was like 25,000 pro prologue of when the parents met, right? And their love story. And so, yeah. And I'm like, well, so we can put it, we can release it. We're going to put it on, we can do a book bub for it. It'll funnel. This is a million. I read everyone into the book. And they're like, we're not going to do that. I'm like, what do you mean? We're not going to do that. I already have it all planned out. So I already wrote it. We just get a cover and we do it and we release it. And they're like, we're not going to do that. I'm like, we, you have to do that in the entire thing. And you'll see reviews are like, oh, I wanted to know what happened with the parents. And I'm like, I wrote it. It's sitting here. It's on my computer. I wrote it last night. 
they were like, no. And so it's, it's so frustrating. And I love my trad team. I love them. I love my editor. I love my agent, but I'm like, what are you talking about? Let's just do it. And we have all these pre-orders like this is one book, bub, like, and I, it's unfathomable to me, but yeah, you have zero control. So I was like, okay. So anyway, I have a hundred K I have a prologue for the book that is just on my computer that I can't. That doesn't sound very fun. Yeah, I wish I could help you with that situation, but when it comes to your serial fiction, when it comes to maybe more specific insights around, we're talking about subscription services, indie authors being able to make money in different ways. Obviously a very common thing that many people listening to this are already doing or want to do is offer early access to their stories, chapter by chapter, inside of a subscription service, and then share it elsewhere on serial fiction platforms and have that whole funnel that brings new fans in, super fans come, pay you monthly. And that, that can be a great business model for people, but obviously that, that still comes down to writing great serial fiction. And I'm curious when it comes to the actual, we'll start with the length of chapters. What have you found is a good length in romance? And if you're familiar with other genres, I know you obviously are much more familiar with romance. What would you say, how does that vary in terms of serial fiction, in terms of the chapter so length? say which what you said about bringing in and i was talking to millie about this yesterday the most important thing with any of this and what if i was releasing today radish got big by rob fear everyone look him up at wattpad they pretty much built their model about him and so he was like huge on wattpad and sai who's the ceo of radish was like do you want to get paid so he would put his chapters on wattpad say if you want to read it earlier so he was again the number one on radish i was number two and he would then say hey if you want to read it early you go and pay at radish right and so that is how they built the model at towards the end he was making eight thousand an episode i was making around five to six an episode right per episode every time i do it okay so initially i would say the answer to your question is the ideal chapter length when i write books is always two thousand words always however if i'm on radish i do the minimum because i want to get paid more and that sounds bad but whatever and so first season i didn't i just actually put up the way i did but for since i wrote third season when i was already on radish which isn't up sorry fans it's not up, but they're all around the minimum length because I'm getting, I'm paid and, and monetized that way. If I was launching today, and this is what everyone wants to know. So it's always, because people will say, which I agree. Oh, she was, sure. She was great in Radish in 2017. Radish sucks now, or this is a whatever. Yeah. So that's true. And the industry is always changing. So KU1, it was, is we got paid per borrow so it didn't matter about the word count so you know at 25 i would get a dollar 25 versus a book it made more sense for me to write smaller and then ku2 we would start writing bigger books so i would write super long books because then we got paid by pages if i was launching today with a subscription model this is exactly what i would do and this is something milia has done and i think that the top things you have to have a funnel this is a business thing which is why i want to do the funnel for my trad book but nobody will let me but that's like beside the point. So I would put chapters, I would put clean and I hate the word clean. I would put non sexy chapters up on Wattpad to build my following. This is me like random, not Alana author, brand new, zero platform, no newsletter. Nobody knows me. I would put stuff on Wattpad. I would start building a following. I would use all their hashtags. I would do all that kind of stuff. And then I would slowly invite people to Patreon to get early access and the sexy scenes, right? So this works for romance, right? Now, if I was sci-fi or mystery and I was not doing something with a kind of, you know, a sexual content, then I would say, oh, bonus scenes or action scenes or whatever. So the exclusivity, exclusivity is behind the paywall, right? And so anyway, you, this is your funnel. You need a funnel for your entire business. I read this one book recently by this author and it was so good, better than anything I've ever written. Horrible cover, not a good blurb. And I, she was like, I'm like, yeah, your book's better than anything I've ever written. No one knows about your book. Oh, like if people don't know about your book, they're not going to find it. Back in the day in 2013 and 14, when I released, you would just, there weren't that many books. So sure you would see it. Same on Radish, same on Wattpad. You have to have some type of marketing in Wattpad. You can go into the forums, you can talk to people and you're not just, it's the same with social media. You're not just buying a book. No, you're literally interacting in this community and you're being part of it and you're slowly sharing it. And anyway, you're creating your funnel and you're getting over there. So anyway, long answer to that, 2000 words is ideal. But if I'm on Reddit and I'm monetizing it, it's just that I do the bare minimum because I want to get paid for the next chapter to 800. I think that's great. And I think it's very important for people to have these funnels. It's essential to be able to do that. I know, especially in progression fantasy and lit RPG, like 
Wattpad might not be the place for you, but Royal Road probably is a good place Absolutely. to go and discover those new fans. So there's probably a place out there for you. Even if we have comic book creators listening, I see comic book creators posting panels onto Twitter and especially Instagram and carousels and being able to have each image be a new kind of carousel do really well. And I'm curious for you, actually, what is your take on the rise of serial fiction podcasts, having audio serial fiction? So mine is in a podcast also. And so I put it not just in audio, but I put it on a podcast based on, there is another author who did it, Scott something, and that's how he got a big deal. He went trad by putting it. So all the different types of media, that TikTok, doing that with it, that is incredible. You're reaching readers. Here's the key though. Your readers are different. I was always under this delusion. So once I was huge on Radish, I was like, this is one one of my author failures and I have plenty of them. Not all of my books have been successes, but I was huge on Radish. And so then I like release some book, which I thought was good on Amazon. I didn't do ads and whatever, and it didn't do that well. And I was so shocked because I just thought I was this like really big, but Brad, there's zero crossover in my world from Radish or whatever. There might be more with a Patreon versus Amazon, but you have your audio readers are not. And one of the other things I really teach, I have a newsletter class and I'm like really obsessed with active campaign and I funnel all my readers. So I have who my audio readers are, who my radish readers are, and I send them different stuff. And and this is marketing and understanding your customer, right? So the person who's listening to the podcast says awesome. And you might get people that then maybe you're funneling them into your audio books and not necessarily into your ring, unless you, know, you have audio on there. So there's all these different things, but some people listen and they go and they walk like their dog or whatever, or they're working out. And that's when they're listening to fiction. Some people read while they're waiting to pick up their kids. Some people only read at the airport. And so it's another thing, delusional fantasy. When Ramon came out, I thought, so I have 97% of my sales from Ramon and I've sold 11,000 copies are print. Okay. My pre-life. So my indie books, I know is the exact opposite or 97% ebook, 3% print. So the P this book and why they price the ebook 999, the prints 1299. No one's stupid enough to spend 999 in an ebook, right? So I had this delusional fantasy also that people would read my backlist, right? Like I teach this backlist boot camp class also. And I was like, oh, they're all going to read it. But I get all these reviews on Ramon. I just read this debut book for this author. She's so amazing. Can't wait for a second book. I'm like, I got 30 one go to amazon fine but they won't even touch my ebooks and i'm like because they're like i read books that like are like real books in real bookstores and the rest of mine aren't and i'm like oh yeah this book no one cares no one will even read it so your readers are different they're not in a monolith and they have different reading habits and you have to understand that to market to them yeah that's really that. it's hard to actually get a grip on that behavior it's horrible. I understand. I mean, <laughs> yeah i mean i actually am a bit surprised too that but I guess that's exactly where they're coming from. Your sales are not really even coming from people buying necessarily the print book on Amazon. They're literally going to the indie bookstore or Absolutely. their local, maybe Barnes and Noble. And then they're going there and get, getting your latest book, but there's the, the, rest. the rest of your backlist isn't there because obviously there's like, we've been talking about maybe some gating that goes on. That's really a dumb business move on their part, because imagine if they had your backlist of 30 books there that people could then go to the person who runs the store and be like, Hey, I'm interested in the new Alana book. Like where are her other books? Are there other books? Yeah. We carry 30 of them. They don't choose to do that. They carry um, none then they don't want to because they don't want to support Amazon. That's why you, ha you have to, and you can't even reach them because they don't know. And this doesn't, like my, for book two, which I don't even have an arc for yet, it says other book by Alana Albertson, Ramon and Julieta, which is why I passive aggressively in my bio wrote author of 31 books. So hopefully someone will be like, oh, where are those other 31 books? <laughs> She's written, yeah. On her, oh, has written 30 romance novels. So that's what I said that, yeah. They're, they don't look. But the other thing that's really important, even if, forget trad, because that's specific to me or hybrid authors. I teach this backlist boot camp class. And so I had this super fan. So she was like, she loved one of my most recent books and she kept talking about it and talking about it. And she would write me on Messenger. And then I said something like, I'm like, oh, it's like Shane. And who's the guy in Badass, who's my number one book. And she was like, who? And I'm like, Shane, like the hero from Badass, like my best selling book. She's like, oh, I'd never heard of it. I'm like, you're my super fan. Like, you didn't, the minute you found love with my one book, read my 30 back book. And she didn't. And so that's when I started thinking, okay, I have fully failed as an author because this is my biggest fan. She doesn't know about it. So now I send out weekly to my newsletter list. Hey, this is a book I released four years ago. This is what it is about because I'm under this delusional assumption that someone reads my book and they read my backlist. That doesn't even 
doesn't happen in the indie world. You have to constantly market your old book. And because the, yeah. the only good thing about me not being allowed to release for the two year for the past two years, kill me, it's horrible, is that I've learned to market my backlist. Cause I was like, I never marketed my backlist. This was my income. I would release four books a year or some novellas or like three and two novellas or whatever, which were my serials. And I would release them, then hit top hundred and I'd make money and I would move on with my life. I never promoted my backlist unless it was like first of my series and a new book was coming out and that and I would get a book. But besides that, I didn't do anything. And now I'm like, I, I take my 30 books, I have 52 weeks and I chart it. I'm like, okay, this week I have to promote this stupid book. And I go through it because no one's heard of these books. These books are still good. They're a product. You have to divorce yourself from the book and emotionally detach yourself and say, okay, I have 31 products and I need to be promoting them at all times or stagger them so people know about them because people forget. Yeah, I completely agree. We actually started like a automation for my backlist this year. Yeah. And we, we do one a month just because I do an email every week for my front list. And I was looking on Amazon. I guess like the day after the automation was released and I, I didn't even know the automation was released and I was like, oh my gosh, why am I getting so many sales for this backlist book that I've never gotten this many sales on before? And then I like go into the automation. I'm like, oh, it's because we just promoted it. And so yeah, people like don't know. You're they, exactly like, same like your me. biggest fans who, yeah, no, I just, so it's insane. I have an automation. I did the same thing. I put one of my uh, books, I think it was Doggy Style. It's my, I run a dog rescue. This is one of my favorite books. <laughs> and I, I forgot that I did the automation and I'm like, did someone mention it on TikTok? Cause I know my baseline sells yeah. book, get a sale or two, like nothing. And all of a sudden I was like, sold so many of them. And I'm like, oh, my thing went out. And I'm like, why am I not, am I shy about promoting my books? No, your, your fans want to know it, but yeah, you can't forget about your past books. Yeah. That's a really important one to remember. Cause it, yeah. People, when they stop reading a book, like most of the time they go out, like they might want to read another book, but they've got to go on with their life first. And the, in that break, there's this whole time where you can miss them. They don't always read the back matter that you have or click on those links yeah. if they're an ebook. Yeah, no, that's really good insights. The last thing I have, the last question I have, which is, what would be your advice on some of the mistakes you made in your career? that if you could go back, maybe that you wouldn't do differently, but you would tell someone else to do differently. I know you've highlighted a few things, but okay. is there anything else you haven't mentioned that you just want to bring up? I did everything wrong. I shouldn't even have a career. I shouldn't be on here, but I literally did. But I didn't know what it was doing. And I think now there's at least when I did it, it was kind of like the wild west and people were doing it and whatever. So there's so many, there's so many great resources, obviously your podcast, YouTube. I'm probably going to start a YouTube channel soon. You really need to listen to what's happening a lot. I hear a lot of kind of like statements like, oh, my book's super different than anything ever has been written. Now, if you know anything about trad publishing, they want the exact same thing, but slightly different, right? So you need to see see what type of books are selling. One of the best things I did in my career, I'm going to go to the worst in a second, but one of the best things I did to, in my career, I never want to say I follow trends. I want, I want to set them, right? But like I knew stepbrothers were coming up big more in the erotica world. So we made a full length novel out of that. I'm working on a monster romance right now because I think that's the next thing. I reverse harem or whatever. So you want to watch what's selling. You don't want to copy. You want to have your own voice, your own spin on it. But number one, you need to watch the market. Like number two, and though I said, I constantly did my own thing, which worked out well for me. The biggest failure, the reason I don't think, you know, some people know, and I, when I think of the top romance authors and some of them who started at my time, what they did very well, which I completely miserably failed at, is I wrote a paranormal and then I wrote a military romantic suspense and then I wrote a contemporary romance and then I wrote a serial and then I wrote a rom-com. I was all over the place and that your reader has an expectation and they want the same thing, but different. They want to feel something. They want to know every time I read an Amelia book, like I feel this thing, right? And the thing is I've completely failed my readers in terms of consistency right now. It's not my fault because I tried contact, I promise. But prior to that, it was a hundred percent my fault and I own that. So what I would do right now, yes, I would a hundred percent have a subscription because you control that, you control those names, you control everything. So I would do that. The other thing I would do is I would not release one book unless I had, and this isn't my theory. This was Liliana Hartz. I think she said it at a conference years ago. You have two in the hole, three on deck. So basically I wouldn't really, if I'm this brand new baby author, I would have three books written. I know that's painful because you just want to get that book out, but then Pete, you have nowhere to 
send your authors. So I would write three books and I would release them a month apart in rapid release while I'm working on those two. So day year one, I would have five books out and then I would keep going and I would be consistent. Now that doesn't mean you can't do some of the cool things that I did in terms of, okay, I want to do a trad book or whatever, but I would consistently serve my reader what they wanted. And I fully failed in that. I have complete, the only time reason I'm ever going to finish a series is because I'm under this legal contract <laughs> to for trad because I'm already like, oh, look, the other thing, like I'm full on AD, do not want to stay in that. But that is my failure and don't be me. I think a lot of people would love to have experienced things you have, but I think uh, it's very humble in you saying that we all have different paths and that maybe trying to emulate anyone's path isn't always the best idea. But I think you gave some great insights. And the last thing is I'd love where people can find you. Let us know where authors can keep in touch. I know you create a lot of things that help authors. So where can we yeah, find so, you? Yeah, so I mean, I'm on Instagram. I do respond. I have an email. I offer courses also. I have, I think, five classes on newsletter, backlist, serial fiction, breakout book, which is really one about craft. That's the only one that the serial class talks about craft too, but the breakout one really does and an Instagram class. And I do that. I know a lot of people do classes like I have my master's in education from Harvard. I used to be a teacher. It's a passion of mine to actually teach and give back. And then affordable options. Again, there's so many great things on YouTube. I do plan to start a YouTube channel also, but yeah. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. Definitely check it out. The link will be in the description for everyone listening. And Alana, we had an amazing time chatting with you today. Thank time. you so much for being here. And I hope everyone had a great time listening. All right. So I hope y'all enjoyed this podcast. If you're watching the video version, you probably noticed my eye looks weird. I've had pink eyes, so my eye is swollen. Uh, if you made it to the end of the audio version, you just learned a new fact about me. It's going away. I'm, I'm okay. It's slowly getting better. But thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I love Alana. She's an amazing human, and we're very lucky that we had her time today. I also want to just share with you that we have a big event coming up, very big event. It's called the Subscriptions for Authors Summit. You might wonder why I waited till the end of the podcast to share this. I want to make sure the people who are most excited about it, the people who are most involved, hear about it first. So if you listen to the end of the podcast, you're part of the cool author club. You're part of the awesome author club. We'll have to come up with a, a name for the people who listen to this section of the podcast. When most of y'all have stopped listening, y'all are the warriors. And y'all are going to be rewarded by getting an invite to the first ever virtual but live, Subscriptions for Authors Summit. It's a three-day conference taking place from May 5th to May 7th. It's totally free. And you can sign up at the link in the description and get your ticket to attend. It's going to be a really fun time. We have amazing speakers like Christopher Hopper, Reese Barden speaking. We have Kay Webster. We have Rodney Lee Smith. We're going to be highlighting topics all the way from serial fiction to how authors in Kindle Unlimited have been able to grow a solid subscription fan base where their fans pay them directly every month. I'm so, so excited. A lot of work has gone into this and we wanted to announce it when it was pretty much finalized. We wanted to share with you like pretty much a finalized schedule, pretty much finalized event lineup. Cause one, I wasn't sure if we could pull this off because we just started like getting the idea probably in early March. Um, but a lot of work went into last month. The teams rallied the troops and as a community, we've come together to create what I think will be a truly, truly special event in publishing. And if you're a subscription author, will be the event to be at. So I hope to see you there. And in the meantime, I hope everyone listening has a happy time writing. And don't forget, storytellers rule the world. Storytellers rule the world.